Over to you, Shanta. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm honored to introduce our next speaker, uh, David Van Valen. So, David, please take it away. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and I am sharing uh, my screen. Are, are folks able to? Uh, are folks able to see my slides? Yes. Thumbs up. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, I actually, you know, didn't really have a good sense of what to prepare. Uh, and you know, I think what I've what I've got is sort of like a a a brief biography with some of the you know trials. Uh, challenges and then also like life lessons sort of uh, mixed in um, as we go. Um, and so yeah, with that, uh, I'll, I'll I'll get started. Uh, so I was born uh, uh, in Los Angeles, actually. So I'm at I'm at Caltech. So in a, in a very real way, being here uh, does feel like home. Uh, to uh, my dad, Joseph uh, Joseph Van Dalen, and also my mom, uh, Loretta Carroll. Uh, what's less known is that uh, both my mom. Um, and my dad were Caltech and MIT alum, uh, respectively, and they grew up in a generation where, you know, a lot of the universities were, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us are at. Uh, it was sort of like the the first time period where folks were actually trying to integrate uh, Black students into the student body. Um, so my mom was actually uh, at in in the first class at Caltech uh, to have Black women, um, and my dad um, at MIT, you know, it was only a few classes up prior where they had uh, where they had where they had Black men, uh, and I just I just. Bring, I just would like to highlight this uh, because, you know, at the time, you know, their their admissions uh, were sort of enabled by the affirmative action policies, and you know, we're sort of living through a time period right now where our courts are sort of reevaluating um, that as 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 a useful endeavor, and all of the stuff that I've been able to achieve in my career, um, you know, all of the accolades, all of the mentorship I've been able to give my students, none of that would have been possible without the previous generation. Um, giving my parents a chance to, to have access to this type of education. Uh, so I was actually, you know, sort of identified as being, you know, gifted in quotation marks fairly early, uh, which led to me accelerating through um, elementary and middle school. I want to think, I, I want to say in total, I ended up skipping about uh, four, uh, about four grades. And I actually had a very uh, early interest in mathematics. Um, and so, you know, one of my favorite things to do as a kid you know, was to take these, you know, large, uh, these large calendars that my mom would have uh, half for business and the ones that were left over, I'd sort of take, you know, turn them all the way over and then use them as scratch paper uh, to do, you know, whatever math problems I could get my hands on. Uh, and I was fortunate to have, uh, to have some uh, uh, introduction to teachers uh, early uh, who sort of cultivated this, uh, this interest. And so one in particular was uh, Nicholas Martin, uh, who's now a professor emeritus um, at Shepherds, uh, Shepherds University in Shepherdstown, uh, West Virginia. And he, you know, really took an active interest in my uh, in my academic development. I remember there's a period of time uh, where, you know, I sort of get dropped off uh, from school uh, about like a, an hour too early, where you know me and Professor Martin were just, you know, sort of working on, you know, how to do X Y Z proofs uh, for, you know, for a couple hours, uh, several times, uh, several times a week. Uh, my introduction to physics was a little, uh, a little, a little rockier, um, and so the very first. Uh, time uh, we stepped into a physics classroom. So this was a uh, high school. Um, and so my brother and I, uh, you know, sort of enrolled in the high school physics class, you know, we're relatively young for uh, the high school age. And so they had us take some sort of placement test. You know, we both did like very well. And the response of the, the, response of the uh, teacher was, okay, well, it's not possible for both of you to do well, you know, who cheated off of who. Um, so that led into like a whole, um, a whole session uh, between like my mom, and the um, and the physics uh, the physics teacher and the school and the end result was that you know she said you know there's no way I'm going to let you uh, teach my children physics uh, and so she actually took us out of the high school for the physics uh, and took us to uh, to Shepherd's at uh, the time of Shepherd's College now Shepherd's University and there I actually had a really good uh, physics professor uh, name of Donald Henry um, and you know he sort of uh, taught uh, me and my brother uh, the beginnings you know for mechanics E and M and whatnot and you know really. I say started my uh, my early interest in you know sort of applying some of these uh, you know mathematics and quantitative ideas uh, to quote unquote real world uh, real uh, real world problems. Uh, you know, went to ended up you know applying to a bunch of colleges. Uh, ended up uh, you know sort of uh, going to MIT. This was around 1999, so uh, you know quite some time uh, quite some time ago. Uh, double majored in math and physics uh, with a minor in biology. Uh, in hindsight, you know, I kind of realized now that, you know, biophysics was kind of like what I was trying to uh, sort of the, the core subject material I was trying to uh, get at. 
Um, and so you know, sort of understanding you know, how do living systems work um, using some of the mathematical tooling uh, from you know, math and also sort of the physical uh, ideas and intuition uh, from, uh, from physics. Uh, and so here, you know, the, the double major was really a consequence of the research experiences I had uh, during my uh, sophomore, junior, and then also partially my senior year uh, at, uh, at Caltech. Um, and so, you know, at the, um, at the time, you know, I sort of, fig I, you know, sort of uh, figured, hey, I'll do, I'll do the best I can during my coursework and then reserve the summers for research. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get accepted to a research program uh, at Caltech, which, you know, is, you know, thankfully to this day, uh, still running. Uh, I actually take, I actually am actively trying to take students from, from that program. Uh, and, you know, one of the, uh, you know, one of the research advice uh, mentors that I had during that uh, was Rob Phillips. Um, and so Rob, you know, really kind of inspired me to, you know, up my physics game, so to speak. I ended up adding that as a, um, as a second major. And Rob, um, you know, ended up convincing me to, to join, uh, to join Caltech as a graduate student. Um, ended up doing that through a uh, through the MD uh, PhD program at UCLA Caltech, um, and so you know joining uh, joining Caltech as a as a graduate student, you know I'd say like the the ideas that really uh, captured my interest, uh, you know were sort of you know in hindsight now you know part part science but also like part uh, part art um, in the sense in the sense that you know sort of the 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 things that motivate us you know as you know working scientists you know impact papers funding et cetera et cetera. Uh, that mattered uh, less than, you know, was it interesting and was it beautiful? Um, and so this idea that I was really drawn to was mathematizing uh, the cartoons of biology. And so the, you know, the, uh, I'd say the short version of this is that the, you know, the way in which biologists typically uh, abstract away their notion of understanding um, about how a, a particular biological system works is in the form of these different cartoons, right? And so there's some example cartoons here, uh, one of the foreman, um, a foreman uh, protein sort of catalyzing uh, actin polymerization, a couple others uh, for uh, for signaling, uh, sorry for uh, signaling uh, proteins that uh, sort of use uh, use uh, flexible linkers to connect different domains, and you know are able to use that to lock themselves in different uh, conformational states. Um, similar story for I think I think this is the uh, the the shaker potassium uh, ion channel shown here, uh, but you know details details of like what's actually shown here don't really matter. Just that there are these cartoons. These cartoons sort of evoke notions about different physical mechanisms of how things work. And rather than just taking these cartoons as is, you know, really, you know, sort of taking them seriously, you know, using them to write down, uh, you know, equations using different machinery from physics, um, generating predictions, and then, you know, sort of uh, making the demand uh, that the experimental data that's generated can actually speak to these, uh, these predictions. And during this time, I was sort of active as both a theorist, you know, sort of, you know, sort of uh, taking work that other folks have done, uh, creating some models based on, you know, polymer physics and equilibrium system mechanics and generating predictions. Uh, but then also uh, towards the uh, latter part of my uh, PhD um, in the experimental lab uh, as well. And this was an activity, you know, that was, you know, made, that was made possible by uh, generous support from the uh, Fannie and John Hertz Foundation, who funded uh, uh, most of my most of my graduate education, uh, gave me leeway to, you know, sort of make it a, a pure uh, more of a pure educational experience. And, you know, I decided, you know, wanted the theorist uh, toolkit and also wanted the experimental toolkit too. Uh, and I spent some time uh, doing in vitro single molecule biophysics. Um, and then also uh, towards the end, uh, making a foray into, uh, into in vivo, uh, in vivo uh, single molecule measurements. And I say like my, oh, is this able to play? Uh, cannot play media. Oh, that's a bummer. Uh, anyway, this is like this, I say like this is probably today still like my favorite paper, uh, single molecule Hershey Chase experiment. We're able to uh, in uh, in real time, visualize uh, a single piece of DNA getting transferred uh, from a uh, from a bacteriophage into a bacterial cell, and based off of the uh, dynamics that we're able to extract from uh, from these sort of data, uh, we're able to like make some uh, concrete, uh, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down uh, assessments of the different physical theories uh, that are around at the time over over how uh, how this process worked. Uh, I would say, you know, one thing, uh, you know, sort of uh, if I were to build on a, a theme uh, that Christine uh, raised, uh, I would say uh, about, you know, lessons learned, uh, I say like one lesson uh, I learned is that, you know, people aren't really watching you 100% of the time. And, you know, you can sometimes, you know, things that you can actually get away with versus what you're thinking you can get away with are two different things. And so I spent a fair bit of time in graduate school, uh, you know, sort of moonlighting as a jujitsu artist. Uh, like to train at several several different gyms in LA, which is at the time um, still is a is a hot spot. Uh, competed in tournaments, you know, won some pretty nice medals. You know, faced a you know faced a UFC fighter or two uh, in competition. Um, this is a picture is taken at uh, one of my uh, one of my current instructors 
uh, when I uh, just shortly after I joined his gym. Uh, and it was a very, very enriching experience. I'd say, you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the socialization um, that, you know, like I I've, uh, I gained, which I also like uh, kind of needed at that time in my life, um, I gained through interacting uh, interacting with this uh, with this community. Eventually, you know, so I have to realize like, hey, you know, how serious are you going to take the science career? You know, can't spend all your time in the gym. Um, and so, you know, jujitsu sort of went down, the science commitment uh, went up, but, you know, I was very grateful for the flexibility to be able to explore like this part of my, uh, uh, of my, uh, myself. I ended up graduating. Uh, so, you know, uh, one of the I can't, can't lie, one of the happiest days of my life, uh, finishing, uh, finishing my PhD and then also my MD. Um, you know, here, uh, here on the, on the right are, you know, so, some of my former MD PhD colleagues. Um, and actually one of them, uh, this, uh, this gentleman here, uh, John Phillips, uh, he was actually in the MD PhD program with me. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I literally knew him for more uh, than half of my life. Uh, about last year, he ended up passing away uh, from a, a very serious form of, uh, form of brain cancer. Um, and, you know, we were sort of the, the two members uh, of like this cohort of MD PhD students, you know, who, you know, were at Caltech and also, you know, really took a, a, took a liking to, uh, to the scientific uh, career path rather than the full physician scientist. Uh, pathway. Uh, I actually like made an effort to, you know, sort of be a resident and, you know, go uh, finish the clinical training. And after the first year, I just realized, you know, there was really something missing um, in my life. I just really like, you know, the the freedom and the creativity uh, that, you know, that science, uh, that science, uh, a career in science allows. And so after that year, I actually went back uh, to do my postdoctoral fellowship with Marcus Covert um, at Stanford, you know, super appreciative uh, that he was willing to, you know, Take at the time was a fairly, you know, fairly risky bet. Um, you know, very sharp guy, but you know, nice background, nice PhD, but hasn't done anything for the last three years, and you know, also probably wasn't in the uh, best state of mind, uh, you know, when uh, when joining uh, to be productive, like out of the uh, out of the gate. Um, but Marcus, you know, he was a, a very, uh, I say, a very uh, kind um, and gracious advisor, um, and he gave me sort of the freedom and flexibility I needed to, you know, sort of recover from the medical experience. Um, and then also like sort of explore, uh, you know, the research space. And here I'd say like a lot of what, um, a lot of what I spent my time thinking about was just, you know, uh, you know, computer vision methods, how they intersect uh, with life sciences and really how we can use them to scale um, imaging based measurements, uh, you know, some for, from sort of, you know, niche tools that can uh, answer problems for a, particular, for a single data set uh, into more general purpose tools that can be, uh, that can be more widely, uh, widely used. Uh, I'm not sure whether, okay, yeah, these, these movies play. Yeah, and so this is, uh, you know, this is data from, uh, from some of my postdoctoral work, you know, we've sort of gotten these deep learning methods uh, to, you know, do some, 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 at the time, you know, you know, it was a big deal, uh, but now it's some fairly straightforward analyses, you know, identifying nuclei, identifying um, whole cells and whatnot, being able to, you know, sort of get single cell resolution out of some live cell imaging data. Uh, we're also interested in uh, yeah, uh, another, uh, a sorry, another uh, scientific theme I, I started becoming more interested in uh, during this time was integrating different types of measurements uh, at the level of at the level of single cells. Um, so there's this question, you know, you're able to measure all these different things now. Uh, so signaling activity, chromatin state, gene expression, protein localization, et cetera, et cetera. How much are these are these just facets of a, a global notion of a cell state? Um, how much information is actually shared across these measurements versus how much um, is separate. And to really get at this question, uh, you know, really what you need are these integrated data sets, you know, where you've got different facets measured um, at, the same, at the same time. And to do this, you know, it kind of requires that you're able to conserve stellar identity across, across different measurements. Uh, increasingly more common on the, in, the, in the omic space, uh, challenging if you're trying to, you know, sort of add a, add a piece uh, that's, that, that's, uh, that requires uh, some live cell imaging. Um, and during my postdoctoral fellowship, I was part of an experiment uh, where you know we're sort of able to figure out how to do uh, both live cell imaging and single cell RNA sequencing on single cells, and then you know I was able to you know uh, provide a nice opportunity to think about okay, well, how would you actually uh, integrate uh, these sorts of these sorts of data? Start asking um, these sorts of questions. Um, and so in around 2017, uh, sort of on the market, uh, and I was very very fortunate to uh, land an offer to come uh, come back home to Caltech. Uh, you know, sort of what I thought I was walking into was you know this picture here on the left. Uh, you know, when I got there, you know, lab didn't exist, how to get renovated, all that stuff. This is what it actually looked like um, starting up uh, on the right. Um, but these are challenges I was kind of, you know, really happy to have the opportunity to, to face. Um, and so in addition to building the lab, you know, sort of this is, you know, one of the, one of the take home lessons um, that I got from Marcus. And one thing that he always told us uh, was that, you know, people, uh, people are, are more important than science. 
And, you know, I'd say like my, you know, if you take that as sort of like a, you know, sort of an axiom or a theorem, I'd say like my, my corollary, like my personal take um, is that the, the people are the product, right? Like we can do, you know, everyone here on this call is, you know, has, you know, a non-trivial amount of scientific talent. You know, you can perform this, uh, you can perform science in academia, you can perform it in industry. Uh, it's not really the science, uh, at least at least the way I see my role now, it's not really just the science that, uh, that we're trying to produce, but it's actually the people, um, the scientists. Um, and, you know, it's really being in a position to sort of build um, and train the next generation. Uh, there, I think you can really, uh, it really provides a one, uh, uh, well, sort of a, a very deep uh, sense of, you know, mission, purpose, and personal satisfaction. Uh, but then two, it also really lets, uh, lets an individual lab uh, have an impact, you know, that sort of supersedes, uh, you know, sort of the dreams and visions uh, of its uh, of its of its advisor, um, and you know that's one thing that I've really uh, I've really taken to heart with everybody who's sort of you know taken the taken the risk to join a join a relatively uh, a relatively new lab, and you know we're about four uh, four years to change old, you know first stories are starting to come out, um, but one thing that's been uh, pretty uh, I've been the most satisfied with is that these stories. Um, are, you know, are sort of being done uh, by the people who are there, uh, you know, uh, at the at the beginning, and these stories are going to translate into like real, uh, you know, real career progress, um, you know, for the first generation of people who uh, who graduate and leave the lab. Um, so that's something that's been very, uh, you know, very heart, uh, heartwarming to see. Uh, they're, you know, still continuing, I'd say, I sort of, uh, you know, sort of building on some of this, uh, some of the themes that have been, you know, longstanding throughout my career, um, but doing them in a more, uh, more independent fashion and really, you know, taking, um, using the freedom and flexibility to, uh, you know, that sort of a, a uh, you know, having your own lab offers uh, to reallocate resources and, you know, let's say do science and do method, uh, do uh, computational method development in any different way um, than has typically been done, um, really integrating the software engineering um, uh, uh, principles and and sort of magic uh, into the entire process. Uh, currently, about half of my lab works on developing uh, deep learning methods for uh, spatial biology, um, creating you know sort of core algorithms for doing things um, that span the gambit from you know identifying cells, tracking cells, and micelle imaging data, uh, you know quantifying omic signatures, be it um, single molecule fish or you know multiplex uh, immunofluorescence, uh, and really you know pr providing an interpretable uh, lens to these new uh, this new era of spatial data. Uh, that we're uh, that we're now able to generate. Uh, the other half is actively working on either performing uh, new measurements um, or you know creating new technologies uh, so that we can just study uh, information processing and living systems with higher resolution, higher um, and higher scale um, than's previously possible. Uh, first, I focused on the signaling pathways that are responsible for responding to viral uh, viral infections. Uh, that was actually a theme pre-COVID, uh, so you know this isn't a this is a um, a, uh, a uh, this is not out of a uh, sort of a trend, uh, interest in the trend, um, there's just been like a long, uh, a long standing interest, uh, which actually really started back as a graduate student um, when I started working um, on bacterial viruses. But, and I say, lastly, you know, one thing that, uh, that I've been, you know, spending increasing amounts of time thinking about um, are just, you know, how to vertically integrate AI methods into the entire discovery process. Um, you know, can sort of think of, you know, how do we generate a new piece of uh, knowledge about a living system, usually start with some existing worldview, uh, based on that worldview, you come up with sets of perturbations that you might do to explore different hypotheses. You perform them. Uh, you then perform a measurement to look at the impact. You'll then interpret the measurement, and then you'll take those uh, those measurements and update your your belief, your uh, your uh, your beliefs about your worldview. And so, increasingly, you know, just thinking about like, okay, you know, you start having AI methods for uh, you know for doing interpretation, AI methods to accelerate your uh, your how you do your measurements. Uh, Different ways of you know using AI to accelerate how you do perturbations, and you're really thinking about okay, well how can how how can you best uh, integrate uh, vertically integrate AI into each of these different uh, different steps and start thinking about having entire learning systems, uh, meaning not necessarily to automate the entire uh, the entire discovery cycle, uh, but so that it can go faster uh, with less with less capital. Um, and so that's something that we we've just started thinking about um, in more in more detail, and you know that sort of uh, informs you know the folks uh, you know sort of the folks that I've. Uh, been looking at uh, looking at recruiting into into our lab, uh, and yeah, I'd say you know uh, what? Okay, sorry, I think I've got uh, I've got like a got a pre recording uh, on there. Um, yeah, with that, I just have to give a huge thanks uh, to all of my lab members. Uh, you know, they're really uh, really phenomenal people to work with, and you know, getting them to where they need to be, um, and sort of repaying. 
uh, the, the risk that they took uh, joining my lab, um, you know, four years ago when we started, uh, that's, you know, that's kind of at the forefront of, uh, forefront of my mind. Also have to thank a number of uh, collaborators uh, who've been, you know, amazing to work with over the years, and then also uh, different sources of funding, uh, funding and support. And I have to say, you know, if there was any takeaways, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, resilience and self-belief uh, would definitely be one. Uh, you know, you may not have, you know, you've probably heard a little bit at the beginning, but there are different points, uh, you know, in my career trajectory, particularly very early, where, you know, there may have been a result that I didn't want, or, you know, uh, you know, someone who showed up uh, who may not necessarily believe that, you know, I was capable of doing X, Y, or Z thing. Um, honestly, even the decision to uh, apply to an MD, PhD program, when I went to the, the counselor's office at MIT, they told me, don't bother. Uh, it's too, you're too late in the admission cycle. Everyone does rolling admissions. You're not going to be competitive enough, competitive enough, you know, find some industry job and then apply again next year. Didn't listen to them and ended up getting into, you know, two really good programs, uh, one of which ended up, uh, I, I ended up going to. Um, but, you know, to be able to do those things, right, you need to have a voice in your, in your head that really uh, cannot let people who might doubt you or what you can do uh, unduly sway your, uh, sway your decisions. Um, and then also have the resilience to, you know, sort of stick through, stick through the hard times, you know, because a lot of stuff that I showed, you know, nothing ever works on the first try um, or the second try or the third, uh, but the eighth, the 10th, the 20th, uh, you know, there it's there, you know, the success is possible. And it's just, are you going to be around, uh, you know, still trying uh, to, 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 um, to, to see that. Um, and yeah, and then I say that the last would be people. Uh, you know, science is done. Uh, science isn't done by robots uh, or algorithms. Uh, it's done by people. Um, they're the engine that keeps this whole thing going. And you know, they really need to be uh, empowered and respected uh, for uh, for the sacrifices they make uh, to keep this whole this whole system going. So yeah, with that, I'll stop. Anyone has any questions? Uh, super super glad to uh, glad to answer. Uh, thanks so much, David. That was a really inspiring and touching talk. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about all the wonderful, wonderful mentors you've had. Um, but I think for the interest of time, we may want to move on to the next talk. But I'm 